Okay, so this is the beginning of lecture six proper. And I want to discuss um, something called the muon lifetime. And this is discussed in all introductory relativity classes, not just because um, it's a proof or experimental verification that relativity is correct, although it is, but also it's, it's a good example problem, right? It's a good example of applying time dilation formula, if you wish. Now, if you are actually interested, I can forward you an actual paper to the real experiment with muons. There are lots of subtleties that I'm not gonna discuss. So just in case, if you're curious, that resource is available. So anyway, um, so here's the Earth. And here's sort of the top of the atmosphere. Now, atmosphere, where's the edge of the atmosphere? That's kind of a, a question of convention. But let's say muon is created three kilometers above the ground. Why is muon created? Well, because Earth is bombarded by cosmic particle, particles. And when they hit the atmosphere, they start reacting with atmosphere and they produce other particles including this color, things called muons. Muon is like a heavy electron. I think it's even called heavy electron. So if this is H, okay. Now muon has a lifetime. So it has, it, it lives for only a certain amount of time. And it turns out that, well, muon moves with speed V. Uh, it turns out that a V times lifetime of muon okay, is uh, uh, less than h. In other words, it will have traveled the distance less than h before it disintegrates into other particles. So therefore, we should not observe them on the ground. However, these upper atmospheric muons are actually detected. So why is that? And relativity explains why that. So first, Note, when we talk of muon's lifetime, what we mean, it's the lifetime of muon at rest. In other words, it's the proper time. It's the lifetime of a muon in its own reference frame. So if I have a lab and I created muons in the lab, okay, and here's a muon sitting in the beaker, then it will, that time is what we mean by lifetime. From the perspective of the reference frame attached to the earth, However, a muon decays slower than it would had it been at rest. So its own internal processes will slow down according to Earth. And so therefore it survives long enough time to reach the ground. Let's look at an example. Okay. So muons a lifetime equals 2.2 times 10 to the negative six seconds, or 2.2 microseconds. There is a subtlety, there are some subtleties here. I'm not gonna go into that. I'm not gonna discuss the fine print. Let's say all muons live for this long and then they, they uh, disintegrate into other particles. Okay, let's say H equals three kilometers. Muon is created three kilometers above the ground. And it's moving at 98% of the speed of light, V equals 0.98 C. According to observer, observer on the ground, it takes 10.2 microseconds to cross H, to cross this distance. So it ends up taking much longer than, uh, than, than its lifetime, right? So this is much longer than 2.2 microseconds. So it seems the muon will decay way before it reaches the, gr the ground. However, while this much time passes on the ground, how much time passes according to muon? Okay. But while 10.2 microseconds passes on the ground, only 
10.2 microseconds divided by gamma passes in mu times frame. Okay, so this is the proper time. Okay, in muon's own frame. In the frame in which muon itself is at rest, and all the muon's clocks are at rest. Okay, so what is gamma? You can convince yourself that when with 0.98 of C, gamma is about 5.03. The 10.2 divided by 5.03 equals about 2.07 microseconds, giving enough time for it to reach the ground. And vice versa. When 2.2 microseconds pass in muon's frame, about 11.1 .1 microseconds passes in the Earth's frame, which is longer than 10.2 microseconds, uh, the time span that it takes for the muon to reach the ground. Okay, so this is the classic lifetime of the muon example. So I want to look at another related problem. Okay, so you have a lab. Okay, and in a lab experiment, a muon, again, a muon is created, and it's observed to travel 800 meters before disintegrating. So this is not a, this is not a, a kind of muon that's created in the upper atmosphere. It's a muon that's created in a lab. Okay, and it travels, uh, and it travels uh, 800 meters. A student looks up the lifetime of the muon, uh, two, let's say two microseconds, and concludes that its speed was 800 meters divided by two microseconds. And that comes out to be four times 10 to the eight meters per second. Okay, so you have an interplay of uh, large velocities and small times. Okay, and four times 10 to the eight meters per second is faster than light. So what's the student's error? So think about it, let me write down. So example two. So lab, so here's your lab. So muon, muon, uh, okay. muon is created. It travels 800 meters and it disintegrates. Okay, now lifetime of the muon, for the sake of this problem, I'm gonna say equals uh, two microseconds. Okay, 2.2 .2 wouldn't really make it not faster than light. It's still, uh, it's still gonna be faster than light. Okay, so I'm just gonna round to two microseconds. The student says, V of muon equals 800 meters divided by two times 10 to the minus six seconds. Actually, you don't need a calculator for that. So 800 divided by two is uh, 400. Yeah, just a second. 800 divided by two is 400 times 10 to the six. 400 times 10 to the six meters per second. That's four times 10 to the eight meters per second, okay? So that's bigger than C. The question is, what's wrong? So this is a classic example of common mistakes at this stage of um, digesting relativity is that one quantity is expressed in one reference frame, but another quantity is expressed in another reference frame. Okay. And so uh, the answer, what's wrong, so pause the video, think about it, is that a velocity is the distance divided by uh, the time it took. So we are told the distance traveled between the birth and the disintegration of the muon is 800 meters. This is the distance measured in the lab frame. 
However, two microseconds is given in the frame of the muon. Okay, it's the proper time. The proper time because the birth and decay took place at the same location in muon's frame. So this is the prop, this is the issue. So 800 meters is in the lab frame, but two microseconds is in uh, new one's uh, own frame. Okay. So when you calculate velocity, you can have one quantity in one frame and another quantity in another. Of course, you're going to get nonsense. And so let's do this properly. Let's do this properly. So uh, in the lab frame, so let's convert the time to the time in the lab frame. Okay, so in the lab frame, uh, the time between muon creation created and uh, muon decays is dilated. Yeah, well, the, the, let's say not like that. The muon lasts gamma tau. Okay, so this is uh, this is tau. It's a proper time, so we can use the letter tau. Now, gamma tau is 2 times 10 to the minus 6. We don't know velocity, right? So 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, so velocity then is 800. I'm not going to put units divided by 2 times 10 to the minus 6. So this is distance in lab frame. And this is now time in lab frame. So now we're all good, but we have kind of a convoluted expression, right? Okay, so this is the time in the lab. Okay, and so I can clean it up. I can say V equals four times 10 to the eight meters per second times this dimension is factor one minus V squared over C squared. And then you just need to solve for V, okay? And you would find the actual speed. The rest is just sort of my suggestions for how to do this. When we work on problems in relativity, it's often convenient to express, express speeds not in meters per second. Meters and seconds are not convenient units. Okay, they're units, again, designed for uh, human scale uh, experiments, human scale stuff, cars, horses, uh, but not for things that move close to speed of light. So therefore, it's often convenient to express speeds as fractions of the speed of light. So let's see, um, four times 10 to the eight meters per second equals four thirds C, you can convince yourself. So therefore, uh, V over C equals four thirds times one minus quantity V over C squared. And you can see why this is becoming convenient. I'm going to call this u, okay? And so I'm simplifying u equals four thirds, one minus u squared. You see how convenient it is, okay? Um, you can just solve for u. And the beauty of this rescaling is that we don't have to deal with ridiculously large numbers. Okay? Everything becomes of order one because maximal speed or maximal fraction of the speed is now one. All speeds are less than, all, all speeds are a fraction of C that's less than one. Anyway, uh, without further verbiage, uh, you will find that U equals four thirds. Okay, so this is not, this is, this is the U and this is number four, okay? U equals four thirds divided by the square root, one plus, four thirds quantity squared, and that comes out to be nicely 0 0.8. So IE, V, speed of the muon as seen from the lab. We will also discuss that speeds also, well, speeds obviously transform from frame to frame. So this is 
uh, v in labs frame, although that's not really necessary to say, uh, is 0.8 C, which is about 2.4 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. The speed of the lab relative to muon is also the same. Velocity would have opposite signs, but speeds are the same. Okay, so, uh, so I just gave you example of two problems related to time dilation, rather straightforward problems, but they, the second problem in particular showcases common errors, common issues that come up. And also you can see that, well, not everything is just like a completely one step or problem, right? So you have to, uh, when you have to write things, you, you can see that things can appear in a convoluted way and you have to solve for velocity. That's okay, you can do that, okay? Uh, so I will see you in the uh, next video and we will discuss another effect called length contraction. Okay, thanks.